Okay, so the title, uh, Become the World's Leading Authority in Your Space. Uh, Bill Sanders, I've had a chance to speak with you, and as you know, I've worked with Rod Collins in the past and have a very uh, interesting understanding of what he's doing. I know he's doing some of that with you, and you certainly have a unique position. Susan Younger, uh, same thing with your, your group and your organization and the value proposition that you bring to the table. Ariana would certainly love for you to find that space and really hone in on that women's health, women's empowerment opportunity because you have the presence to really become that world's leading authority that you and I have spoken about uh, in the past. And I look forward to finding about more of your pursuits uh, with our friends at blackowned.com as well. Uh, so let me get started. This The idea behind this, this workshop, and, and Linda and I had actually worked this out in advance, to deliver on the promise of really making sure that you get value from this. I'm going to need, I'm going to uh, beg your indulgence for probably about 30 to 40 minutes of your time for me to explain as thoroughly as I can what it is I mean about becoming the world's leading authority and then we'll shift into the workshop mode where I'll start to transition to if I were in your shoes, what is it that I would do? I don't have any of the expertise that each of you have, but if I had your expertise, this is exactly what I would do. And I'm actually going to use myself as the example. I'm going to be able to speak in the first person of not only one, but two different platforms uh, that I intend to be launching. One that I'm launching right now with my lady friend, uh, which is in the descriptor of this deck, and a second which I'll perhaps speak to if I remember uh, to talk to it uh, during the discussion here today, how I first cut my teeth on this uh, becoming a leading authority in the space. So if I can get my deck to work, uh, yes, now it's working. So as, as Linda had mentioned, um, we're both in, as are many of you with C-Suite Network, most of you know us uh, for the few of, the, the few of you here that don't. Uh, we are the world's um, leading authority in the space of these thought leadership platforms, which is akin to becoming the world's um, uh, leading authority in your space. C-Suite Network is an extraordinary organization from the perspective of we are a business to business networking platform. But on top of that, we are keenly interested in elevating each individual membership. We offer a variety of different uh, methodologies and services to do that. Um, many of you have seen this. We used to uh, use the reference of the sequoia tree. And now what we're using as we continue to evolve and even understand our own space, we use the honeycomb. And this is what we're doing to elevate uh, members and for you as prospective members, what we can do to potentially elevate, elevate you. In terms of networking and education, the type of content that Linda's community continues to pump out uh, day in and day out. Linda, I don't know if anybody more prolific in delivering like valuable and, and new and the quantity and quality of content that you do. Uh, so thank you always for your contributions. The professional services team where, where I come from, for those that want to get some additional um, elevation services, we've got a team of people that do that. The media, which has been the core uh, proposition of our organization, and my hat's always off to Jeff Hazlett and Trisha Ben, our founder and our CEO, and what they're doing in the media space. So I'm going to get into that a little bit, or actually a lot, as to how that's going to have an impact on your lives, your business lives uh, going forward. And then the marketplace, what we're building slowly but surely, is to become the Amazon of the business to business decision maker. If there's someone in human resources or compliance or in change management or in health services, that, that C-suite is the place that becomes synonymous with what I think of when I'm going for uh, replenishing like, like my cycling materials, I just go straight to Amazon. Uh, you'll see C-suite becoming that on a going forward basis. Some of you know some of this about me, uh, uh, most of you don't. I figured I'd just share very quickly about myself. I think number 11 must be my lucky number because I was born in the 11th, but I'm also the youngest of 11 uh, kids in my family. All of us now are like 60 to 80 years of age, but I still, when I mention number 11, I think of the kids. But um, it, it delivers a lot of youth and a lot of passion, a lot of exuberance, which you'll see from me uh, throughout this discussion. I'll probably talk fast and most of the time have a smile on my face because I just, I've always adapted that youthful model. That's enough about that. Um, my chair of joy is my bicycle, which I will be on tonight. I live in Southern Florida. As I'm talking to you, I'm looking up at the window. There's a beautiful sky in front of me. And I can see moving from east to west this huge 
thunderstorm that's going to be coming through and the rain's going to come pouring down from five to six. And I'll be out on my bike at 630 tonight uh, working up a great sweat. And as I learned from um, from uh, Cheryl, that my chair of joy is my bicycle. I'm most grateful for my two kids. My son is 30, lives in Boston. My daughter is 28, lives in New York City. And I'm, I'm so happy that I get to talk and communicate with them and sometimes several times a day, but at least almost daily for the both of you, for the both of them. But the last part, I'm going to actually slow down my cadence here for a second because this really is the essence of me from the business community perspective. Around the age of 50, I started consulting about the age of 40, 45. And around the age of 50, I stumbled into the nonprofit community because um, one of my uh, partners, one of my clients I was doing some consulting with, had a lot of uh, foundations uh, a lot of nonprofit organizations that they were working with. And I fell in love with an industry that I had never really touched my own business career and found that I had the propensity for the kinds of things I did for coaching with kids. It, it certainly fell in favor with me with coaching in the business to business space as well. For those of you that may work with me at some point in the future, Ariana, I know I could rely on you for a personal testimony. I can see your smile on the screen. But if we ever did get the chance to work together, you'll see how I really pour um, heart and soul into what I do. And I'm certainly going to be pouring heart and soul into this discussion today. So as Linda had mentioned um, in the introduction, the average consumer spends 11 hours a day in digital consumption. And I'd like to use myself as the example, but I think I could really point to probably everybody in the room. I know half of you, if not most of you. And think about, you know, at what time of the day do you start to look at your mobile phone to check out the weather, to look at your agenda for the day, to uh, maybe you're on Instagram or reading the news or whatever that might be. And then throughout the day on our laptops or whatever other devices. And then at nighttime, you know, how much of our time used to be spent with looking at the programming on CBS, NBC, ABC. I'll date myself. I'm almost 60. Growing up, that was how I programmed my life was those three channels over the course of time. But now I, I couldn't even tell you where to find them on where I live in Florida. I don't even know if they're channel eight, seven, four, or two, because all of my information comes through digital consumption these days, even if that's if I'm Netflix uh, binge watching, uh, which by the way, The Last Kingdom, I'm on season five. It's fantastic, really good script throughout. But the purpose of, of, of why we're using this as the focal point of the discussion um, is that the 11 hours a day really means something for all of us in the B2B space and, and for some of us in the business consumer space as well, for sure, for certain. We as businesses are slowly coming around to the fact that we're all in the media business now. Some faster than others. Um, it's, you know, we're, we all come along at our own pace, if you will. But certainly that's, that's the space we're in that, you know, becoming... And authority today really means the recognition of, of being in that space of, of understanding that content, our expertise becomes a part of our delivery today. My first lesson in learning this was around the time that I was 50. I had um, a businesswoman that was working with me who had dual um, uh, uh, master's degrees, one in information technologies and one in, in marketing brilliant um, lady, and she was the one who taught me that my expertise was something I needed to put out there for others to consume. That which I thought was a closely guarded secret and that people would pay me for, which they did at the time, um, was something that really needed to be shared. And certainly that is true of what's, what's going on in the industry today in terms of your content and becoming um, a media-like um, organization, maybe more so than, than you might envision. Excuse me. Um, if you were to ask the automotive industry uh, what industry they're in, you ask the CEO of Ford, he would have said five years ago, we are in the technology industry. I don't know the number of parts in an automobile. I had meant to look it up before this uh, workshop today. I forgot to, but I know it's in the tens of thousands, in the airplanes, in you know, commercial airlines, it's in the millions. But they, re they recognized a long time ago they're really in the technology space today. And when we go to test drive a car today, a big part of our consumption of a brand new car is the, is the content perspective, the information control panel um, of that organization. Bill, I know for you, 
it's high off the road on a very luxurious sweet, sweet ride that can also work in off-road environments. But as an information technology center, it really does uh, so much for you and your business life as you travel on the road and have your business calls like as if you're working out of your office. So recognizing that as, as being in the space that we're in. If any of you have ever seen Jeff Hazlett uh, do a presentation in the past year, you will have seen the COVID wrecking ball. The digital transformation process that, that had been occurring, had already been occurring, the COVID-19 over the past several years certainly accelerated the space of what's happening you know, in this environment. So, so moving in the direction of, of digital transformation, if you haven't already begun to do so, I would encourage you to do so. What I am not talking about is social media marketing, social media publishing, having a social media marketing plan. I'm really talking about putting your information out there in such a way that people recognize and applaud you for your expertise and join and participate in that as an ongoing discussion. We'll get into a variety of examples of what I mean by that. As it relates to there being room for growth in the space. This represents approximately 1% of what 100% of a pie chart would look like. Those businesses that have moved in the direction of actually taking advantage of, we have expertise, we're gonna create a plan to develop an online community where our expertise is shared with that community. They're recognizing us and rewarding us with more purchases of goods, services, products, the people that are in the business to business space actually moving in the direction of transforming and mastering uh, being a real media expertise company, really getting their thought leadership out there, really expanding on, on their becoming an industry recognized authority takes up about 1% of the red line. It's about 0.01% of businesses out there that have truly metabolized in the space. So for example, if your superpower was, I am a specialist in nurse retention. I know everything, no, I shouldn't say I know everything. I know a lot about nurse retention, employee retention in the healthcare community. I may be one of the 20 most experienced, most expertise level people in the space of consulting hospital groups around nurse retention. If I was the one that started to hang my shingle out there in a digital way and creating forums, channels, communities, councils, mastermind groups for people to contribute to that conversation, I would probably leapfrog past those other 19 experts in the space of nurse retention. Even if they've been doing it longer than I had been doing it, even if they had more clients, even if they were better at it, even if their content was better, if I made the leap to jump into the media part of growing your business, I would jump past those people. So there's a wide open space for all of you to jump into that, that uh, environment. So my agenda for today is, is in becoming the world's leading authority, I'm gonna explain what it is that we mean by thought leadership platforms Sometimes at C-suite, we, we refer to them as councils or mastermind communities, whatever it is that you want to call it. I often refer to it as a thought leadership platform. What is it? Why would you want to do it? How would you get started doing one on your own? I'm going to give you some examples. And we're getting into the workshop where we start to help you qualify yourself and talk about, you know, the things that you could do to take advantage. And I'm going to open this up for the group to speak about where you are with your expertise and how you could monetize on that expertise uh, going forward. And actually, uh, Tom Fox, I know that you were here. If you're around uh, 45, approximately 30 minutes from now, 40 minutes from now, we open up to the group. I'm actually gonna, with your permission, use the responses that you gave in the, um, the survey, the registration survey, as an example. I can think of a lot of ideas of how you can monetize uh, this expertise you have in the, in the space of compliance knowledge and compliance consulting. So that's my agenda. My promise to you is, is to give you everything I've got um, in, this, in this space in a shorter period of time and then open it up to really working on it together. So, so becoming the world's leading authority, um, what is a thought leadership platform? I used to define it as a thought leadership platform was whatever your expertise is, 
that expertise is potentially something that becomes intellectual property that can potentially become something that's monetizable. So I'll give you an example. This is the second of the two platforms I intend to launch in my lifetime, at least two. And the second one of the two is I actually have some chops in the space of viral media fundraising. I cannot guarantee that a campaign is going to go viral, a fundraising campaign is going to go viral. But I have studied the space uh, closely enough to understand when things have gone viral, why have they gone viral, and what nonprofits can do to replicate that, that particular formula. And it just so happens in the nonprofit space, which I'll explain why if someone asks me later why nonprofits are susceptible to going viral, if someone asks me, it is absolutely a formula that can be developed and metabolized again and again and again. When I first started to do this as a council with my partners at C-Suite back in almost a year ago, I think it was about 14 months ago, and someone, an expert within C-Suite gave me what it was that I needed to do to launch that council, to drink my own Kool-Aid, I balked and I didn't go forward on it, but I got it in the bag. I know what to do going forward should I want to do that at some point in time. And, and I will in fact do that. But the other one, there's something else that's taking a front seat to that, which is part of the workshop today. The new way that I described the formula capturing on what Jeff Hazlett has said in his leadership within C-Suite is content becomes community, community becomes commerce. And I'm gonna show very specifically um, how, that, how that takes place. I'm going to give you some examples of, of in the space of the world of leading authorities where someone's expertise, where their trusted position, where their brand authority, who they were in the space actually turned into some things that were monetizable. So I'll start with Stephen Covey, who wrote The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. 32 years later, it is still producing return on initial investment. Franklin Covey has produced several billions of dollars of services revenue in their community, professional services, add-on coaching, products, uh, memberships, et cetera, et cetera. I believe they're probably within two to $3 billion. They might actually be in excess of $3 billion, all from the one thought or value proposition. Ariana, I know that you've got it in, in the space of the conversations that we've had should you want to do that, uh, Bill, with where you're heading when we're looking at blockchain and the world flattening and people questioning authority and change management more around uh, leadership versus management with what you're doing, it is a space to come, even if you're ahead of your time. And I do have empathy for you if you're on the bleeding edge uh, because it isn't a, as much fun as sometimes being on the cutting edge, let's say. But I do appreciate um, what you're doing. But, but look at these other names um, in this space. All of them have used their brand authority, have leveraged some cachet that they've built up in the space. For years and years and years, Oprah Winfrey was the number one daytime talk show host and then launched the O Network, which was a series of books, magazines, television networks, television programming, membership services, uh, products, and, and goes on and on and on. Joe Rogan, I bought Athletic Greens because I happened to listen to his podcast. Do I like his position and everything? Not necessarily, but I do like the style of interview. He's very entertaining in the deep dives that he go, goes through. And I have a lot of respect for how he's maintained his own personal health. So I'm actually a user of the Athletic Greens thinking to myself, if he used it, hmm, maybe I should be using it. I'm a couple years older than him, not in as good shape as he is. But each one of these other examples have all been in the space of capitalizing on their brand and building from that. What I wanna reference for all of you, the reason that I'm using each of these individual names or in the, in the business of uh, Barstool Sports, the brand of Barstool Sports, is most of you recognize some or all of these names because they're famous. But it, you don't have to be famous in order for you to metabolize where you're on this space. And I give you a couple examples of it. And most recently is, is Jeff Hazlett built his own fame on the very formula that I'm gonna be describing here uh, coming up. So why would you go down this road of building a community, establishing a thought leader leadership platform, 
putting your expertise out there in such a fashion that people recognize it, can borrow from that expertise, you know, wink, wink, where you're not getting paid for it, but you keep putting out that level of expertise and start to earn some of the brand authority that comes with the fame that these other people have enjoyed. <clears throat> Maybe, of course, on your own smaller scale, I shouldn't say of course, but probably on your own smaller scale, what that can do for you in your industry vertical, become the expert in your space, um, even if everything you touch doesn't turn to gold like, say, Snoop Dogg. So why would someone go down this road? As I mentioned before in the example of that person who is actually a C-suite member who consults to a hospital group in Texas in the space of nurse retention, what he's learned is probably enough for him to replicate that and then create a space where he's the only consultant in the country who specializes in nurse retention um, uh, to then deliver this out on a platform for other hospitals, uh, hospital groups, hospital management teams to consume and then reach back to him for other areas of participation in that community. It opens up the, uh, the opportunity for lots of sustainable new re revenue where your intellectual property could actually be worth more than the actual day job services that you bring to the table. In terms of your day, day job, increased exposure and net new sources of revenue. I'll get into the variety of revenue streams that, that comes from this. And then most importantly, or, or as a byproduct of you establishing part leadership, the ability to expand your reach, your influence, your impact on other people's lives. So we're going to get into, into the workbook uh, part of this here. And I'm going to ask each of you to um, just give um, a little bit of thought to and some of you have already answered this in your questions. For example, Tom Fox, I'm not looking at the attendees now. I don't know if you're still on or not, but if you are. Um, so I know for of some of you, and Bill, I know a little bit about your, your industry, for example. Uh, certainly, uh, Susan, uh, with the conversations we have, I know and admire the work that you do. But for each of you, I'm going to ask you to come uh, off screen when we get to a little bit closer towards the top of the hour. And I ask you, what's your industry? Who do you serve? What are the two or three value propositions that you bring to that table? And I'm going to try to do it in real time, but I'm also going to rely on the group to imagine if you had built a community around that expertise, where it could potentially um, go for you. What would that What would that mean for you? So I'm going to give four different examples of um, what I mean by um, the, the thought leadership platforms. The first one is in the education community. The second one is, is a, our national electric grid, a forum about the, the security of our national electric grid. Uh, someone who is an expert in um, a wealthy uh, a family wealth management and someone who has been on my list who I've got to know um, over the past several months who's brilliant in the space of executive women's burnout. And, and Linda, that was the lady Caitlin Donovan that I referenced previously, and I'll make sure I get you in contact with her. She's absolutely positively brilliant and deserves and should be in front of Leadership Global if she's not already. I'm sure she is, I know you've spoken with her. But I'm gonna use these four different examples of those who are either going forth or have gone forth and what they're doing to build and, and capitalize and monetize um, on their expertise. Each of these models is very different. For a barefoot education, it's a, it's a model where the, where the leadership platform, the content that turns into community, that turns into com commerce, is done on a curation basis. In the example of the Energy Security Council, this is actually a C-suite network Energy Security Council, of which we have about a dozen councils in C-suite network right now, with the probability of a dozen more being added over the course of this year. Um, it's turning a movie into a movement. It's making the, the general population aware of the, of the threats that exist to our national electric grid. More on that later. Um, one of our C-suite members who is an expert in managing large family portfolios like the wealthy and uber, uber wealthy and, and putting his expertise out there in such a way that he gets recognized for not only his, his expertise, but also for his style and panache. We play to each person's uh, strengths. Wherever, wherever, wherever it makes sense to do so. And then uh, Caitlin, who I mentioned before, an extension of her services, her 90-day program on executive women's burnout, the next chapter uh, for those that, that work in her uh, world. 
So, so in the space of, <clears throat> pardon me, in the space of remembering the formula, content, community, commerce, I'm going to share with you this content cycle. And those of you who've seen Jeff present before will have seen this. I'll go through this quickly. Some of you may not have seen this before, but what it's what it's done to do is why it's presented is it's used to describe the quality of the content that you produce and put on display and share increases as as the quality of your content increases the acceleration of your return on objective presumably more customers more client more product and services the more the acceleration of that goes and and while this is not a actual linear progression and say to do this is more valuable than this which is more valuable than this in general the direction of it moving towards the higher the value of content the more return on investment or more return on the objective it's going to deliver for you. And then it actually opens up a whole other suite of revenue services, which I'll get into a little bit later in a, in a future uh, 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 slide in this deck. So for each of you, if you were to look at your expertise and, and begin to build a community around that expertise, for each of you, it's going to vary greatly in terms of what is your body of knowledge, what is your expertise, who is your target market? What kinds of forums might that expertise be made available for? What kinds of conversations and value propositions would exist? And then the structure and growth for you in your particular on the road to becoming recognized as, as a industry thought leader in your space. This is gonna vary for each of you. For many of you, the monetization opportunity is going to have a lot of parallels. There'll be a lot of similarities. In building a space around, um, I'll use Eric Flegel as the example, where he's, his, his best contact person is a business owner who is first generation wealth. So they've built up a business to say $200 million. They've got all these capital gains issues. There's enough equity in their own individual portfolio that now they've got to be thinking about their children and their grandchildren. So it's referred to as first generation wealth. In terms of him building a community around that, he's not addressing his target audience is not all of the wealthy people in the country. His target audience is very specifically the first generation wealth, where it hasn't been passed down from family to family to family to family that the grandchildren are, you know, Ivy League graduated and now managing, you know, the family's five generations of portfolio. His is new money, lots of it. And how does that, how does that become something that you understand all the opportunities? So in building a community around that, we know that there's going to be membership, people that are participating in that on the user side and on the services side uh, within that environment. Um, uh, Bill Sanders, if you're on the call, there might be um, a chief human resources officer who's going through that change management process where everybody, you know, management is, is leveled and there's a whole human resource layer to it. But there's also going to be within your community a CXO level, a former CXO level, former CEO level of a trusted community amongst themselves. And that would be how it would delineate members from super members, uh, for example. And building out um, one of these communities, one of these thought leadership platforms, um, the increased exposure that it does for you in terms of being able to um, uh, embellish or, or um, uh, metabolize the opportunity for more services, more exposure for your day job, and a whole new set of additional services and new sources of revenue as a result of building a community around this sponsors coming in to participate in that community, in that council, in that mastermind group, whatever it is that you might uh, call it. And then other third party experts for each of you, uh, Tom Fox, in, in your world of compliance, there are so many different types of experts that could come in to contribute to your community of compliance mastery from uh, diversity to the hybrid workspace and human resources and, and you know, cyber security and, and on and on. So there'll be other sources of revenue. All of this can come from, from doing this. You know, why would you go in this direction? So here's, here's the example I'm gonna use of myself and it will help you with the workshop portion of this, which I, 
intend to get to in the next uh, uh, five to 10 minutes. My lady friend and I met on eHarmony uh, 11 and a half months ago, almost a year ago, coming up on our one year um, anniversary. I live a block from the beach in Siesta Key, Florida. So naturally, that's where our first dates occurred. And we spent a lot of time in the month of July and August getting to know each other last year and talk about our lives and our backgrounds and our kids and this and that and everything else. And she's been a teacher for 18 years now. Last summer was 17 years that she was a teacher. And she just talked to me over the summer about all of the problems, all of the channel, all of the challenges that exist in education today. Nothing, nothing whatsoever like the challenges that I experienced going up in grade school. It's completely different now than what it was years ago. And as she was talking about all of the challenges, and I began to, to talk a little bit about, you know, thought leadership, her, her mind turned to, well, maybe I should write a book. And she's, she's an English uh, she's a literature major, and that was her natural book. So let's work on that a little bit further. Let's explore this thing a little bit more. And we started to get into this understanding of, uh, well, where in education are we talking about making an impact? And, and as we talked about, could we actually make an adjustment? Could we actually impact education? The first thing that we concluded was to not tackle education reform. The one thing that we could tackle was if something good was happening somewhere, we could replicate that somewhere else. So if there was a teacher of the year, for example, in a state delivering something in, in the relates, relation to science or inclusion, or if it was just energy in the classroom, sustainable energy that, that both the teachers and the students aren't burning out by the time March, April, and May rolls around, uh, is that something that could be captured, curated, and then marketed and multiplied? And so as we started to move further and further away from education reform, we started to look at, well, what about all of the different cohorts within the world of education? And would there be su superintendents around the country interested in other superintendents who have truly made impact, who have truly reformed, who have rejuvenated, who've turned a school system around 180 degrees, what did that superintendent to do for when they did that? And is that replicable in other areas? For principals to be able to do very much what we do in C-suite and around the Hero Club in terms of leadership, is there a principled-centered approach to principles and leadership as opposed to administration and requirements and test scores and meeting all of these KPIs that really befall the education community today. Is there something in terms of leadership where principles could really um, get into it? And so I hate to, to, to get into so much minutia here, but I'm doing it on purpose. And the reason I'm doing it is because my lady friend, 18 years in education, she would be the first one to tell you she doesn't know a lot about business. She doesn't know a lot about marketing. She doesn't know a lot about, as Nancy Geary in our community would say, bundling your brilliance. She doesn't know those things, but she does know where impact has been felt here and there in not only her school system, but around the country. So as we began to go through all these different cohorts, we said, well, you know, is, if it's students, what are we talking about? Well, how about like the basics of what is it like to learn? the joy of learning, the effectiveness. I mean, what are the seven habits of highly effective students is what we were playing with back in August of last year. For parents getting involved, for corporations, the joy of mentorship, not to mention the return on objective. Forget about community affairs, just being able to put good population into the community that becomes future employees of that, uh, that company or that corporation going forward, improving the, the, the gene pool of those coming out of school. So it became very easy to say, let's take some simple things and what we do to build this out. Here was the mind mapping exercise that we did. This was probably August and September of last year. When we first started doing it, we took an Excel sheet and we started to lay out across the top individual cohorts. Who were those cohorts? 
And then we started to go down the left-hand side of the screen and said, what do we want to, to look at in terms of those co cohorts? And this was all on Stephanie. None of it was on me because I don't come from the education space. Who did she know? Who might she know that was a principal? Who did she know that was a teacher that was really doing something to improve energy in the classroom or was a teacher of the year award winner? What kind of research would she had to do? And I encourage you to think about your own space and the people that you serve and what would you need to do to begin to get to know and quantify them. And you can do it on something as simple as an Excel sheet until it turns into something like this. And I owe this to my friend Moritz in Europe, who's part of a mastermind community within C-Suite, who bundled his own brilliance and shared it with the rest of us and gave it to us all on one page. And so as we began to crystallize for barefoot education, what this was going to be, the more we did it, the simpler and easier it became until we got to a point that it now looks like this. We know the two aspects, the two most important aspects of barefoot education. And I promise all of you that are listening to this, I promise you, this is a multi-million dollar idea. I don't know about education. Stephanie does. Stephanie doesn't know about thought leadership platforms. I do. And hopefully what we're talking about today with thought leadership platforms will translate to you and we can help talk about extending this as a, as a coaching service hereafter. But I promise you, this is a multi-million dollar opportunity for the very specific reason we are not trying to tackle education reform at Pennsylvania Avenue in Washington, D.C. We're simply curating a teacher of the year in Minnesota that it works in Florida, a teacher of the year in Georgia that it works in California and vice versa, and helping them replicate their gifts in other schools. And then extending that out to superintendents as if, as if it was the CXO, if you're in the business world, or parents, PTAs, corporations, work from home schooling of all shapes and sizes. These are the two pieces of low hanging fruit that we're, we're delivering on in this community. And it's, it's really, really easy. In her instance, the model is curation. Let's look at these other three, and then I'm gonna open it up to the workshop, what I do in your shoes, and encourage each of you to come off mic and share if you're willing to do so. The Energy Security Council, this is a council within C-Suite that was uh, founded by David Tice, who has now become a good friend of mine. David is a, is a political scientist. He's a person of means. He has children and grandchildren. And in his geopolitic background, geopolitical background, he became acutely aware of the threat that our national electric grid faces to foreign attack. Our national electric grid is the single biggest machine ever built in the world. It is, it is capable of keeping the lights on, borrowing energy from areas where there's abundance to areas where there's deficit and keeping the lights on across the country. But it was primarily built in the 1960s, 70s, and 80s and was not built to withstand cyber attacks, electromagnetic pulse attacks, ac acutely targeted terrorist attacks on the ground and or uh, acts of God like uh, uh, um, electro, excuse me, uh, global magnetic disturbances. But we didn't have, when this was built years ago, we didn't have the threats that we now have from Russia, China, Korea, North Korea, and Iran. They all have EMP and cyber capabilities that could pose serious harm to, the, to our national electric grid. And if you think a blackout like Hurricane Sandy or Superstorm Sandy in the Northeast, which I had a number of years ago, and if you live there when that happened, like for four or five or six days, run on gas, run on water, run on septic, um, for the national electric grid to go down, we're talking about an environment where nine out of 10 Americans would not survive it. That's literally what that means. And David has produced a one hour long documentary. It's um, narrated by Randy Quaid, features um, excerpts from George Carlin. He's got uh, 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 energy experts in this, Ted Koppel, Newt Gindrich, Newt Gindrich, a whole bunch of other uh, people in the space of awareness in this environment. And he's put together a beautiful documentary. And from that documentary, his goal is to turn the movie into a movement. It premieres this July at Freedom Fest in Las Vegas. And C-Suite is helping support him in developing an energy security council, which is made up of citizens, solution providers, 
elected officials, uh, utility uh, commission uh, experts and utility communities to really grow on um, this space. Right now, presently, there's a little bit of an issue that there's special interests which really thwart for various reasons, forward progress in securing our national grid, I'll leave it at that. The movie to the movement is designed to make American citizens aware of the threat and get them to join as a community to first you know, lobby their, their politicians and then in the future apply pressure on the politicians to be able to counteract the special interests of the utility community. But, but I happen to see firsthand, I was in a room in a conference in Orlando a few months back when the concept of the movie to a movement was being explained as a council. In that room were experienced politicians, experienced journalists, and those who've been in the energy industry for some time. When they saw what we were talking about, creating a thought leadership position on this and creating a, a community of people participating, you can see the heads nod. And this had to have been literally, literally, hundreds of years of combined experience of politicians, journalists, and energy experts who said, yeah, I can see what you're doing, how you are not going to be one tree alone in the woods that nobody's around to hear when you're moving this into a thought leadership position. I'll move quickly. Eric Flegel on first generation wealth. He's a natural in terms of his style and being able to position his brand for putting that out on display. We're doing that on a regional basis. Uh, starting in July, we're doing that on a national basis from a digital perspective. He's talking about becoming so good at this, actually licensing what he's doing for others who do his kind of uh, financial in investment. More on that when there's more time uh, because it's a brilliant uh, model of what we're doing with him. And Caitlin Dunham, who I mentioned uh, previously uh, or shortly before about um, developing a, she delivers 90 day consulting services in the field of executive women's burnout. And our clients include Pepsi and other Fortune 100 organizations. And beyond the 90 days, there's a lifetime of being heard, of getting validation, of establishing and keeping to your boundaries, of sharing distinctions and gaining from the collective intelligence of others. It is absolutely, positively, another multi-million dollar opportunity as Linda, I know that you would recognize like in that space, to be able to have that as a continuum of conversation, it's a no brainer. She's not any more brilliant than any other consultant in the space, as well she is, she is brilliant. But to be able to bundle that and then be able to create a thought leadership uh, position around that is truly um, unique. So, so this is the part where I'm gonna transition into, into the like workshop modality here. In light of my, my attempt at explaining a community, in the, in the attempt of building a thought leadership uh, platform, I would ask each of you to imagine as a valued proposition, if you could increase exposure, if you had an ability to extend your services, if you had the ability to develop a community, what might that community look like? And we're gonna open this up to the group. Uh, a couple of slides real quick, open this up to the group to have just a general discussion on this. And is there a continuation of the relationship in some way? And again, Tom Fox, if, if you're on the call still, having just done a quick little bit of a check on some of your space, knowing that there's absolutely positively a continuance, continuance of the relationship, we can certainly you know include you on the hot seat. So if I was in your position, when I'm doing this professionally with C-suite and we're establishing a thought leadership platform, the, the amount of energy and intelligence, the, the, the human resources that we bring to the table to launch one of these platforms with the intention that that platform becomes a multi-million dollar opportunity because C-suite will have a rev share, we have a vested interest in growing that, and we obviously want you to succeed. You can do this without C-suite. I'm happy to teach you how to do it on your own. This is the first step in doing that. In, in getting this off the ground, most people can't afford the price tag for getting it off the ground. And I coach them in this, direct, in this direction. If I were you, this is what I do, would do. How would you know if you had something? As a good friend of mine in, in business in New York City, Stan Adler would always say, is there a there there? So do you have a there there in your business? 
So I ask you, um, what is your value proposition? How relevant is it to your target audience? If you were to form an inner circle of people, if you were going to surround yourself with a dozen people like Rod, excuse me, um, uh, like Bill, I know you're already doing it with Rod and others. If you were to surround yourself with a dozen people, what does that start to create in the way of distinctions? What is the starting point of this community? What becomes of the organic development of that community? And do you have an end game, like Stephen Covey says, begin with the end in mind as the, the second of the seven habits, I think. Who do you know? Who do they know? These are all of the things I would put on the litmus test. If you were going to say, I don't know if there's something here. I think there's something here. Intuitively, I know there's something here. Get with a, a group of other like-minded people like yourself. If you were to build a community where all of a sudden the pizza pie was 100 times the size of the pizza pie that you know, and so you're not so closely guarding a slice, because if you have a dozen people spinning a, you know, splitting a much, much larger pie, what does that collective intelligence bring to the table in terms of who you know, in terms of who they know, in terms of prospects for that kind of discussion, in terms of anchors for that community, in terms of sponsors outside uh, subject matter experts, corporations, communities that, that would want to participate and pay to be part of that community. What does the collective intelligence of that group bring to you in terms of a mastermind principle? And then using the, the, the formula of other people's money, OPM, run that value proposition past potential uh, sponsors. And we'll do this on the hot seat uh, for some of you in, in just a few minutes. Remember the people, as you look through this litmus test, the people that you're targeting, even if it's B2B, could be B2C, could be business to government, they're already consuming tremendous amounts of content on a daily basis. So here's one last second, the value proposition, excuse me, the visual expression of building a, of this content, the community, the, the uh, going to commerce. <coughs> I'm gonna go